We're going to produce at about 1,030 all in sustaining cost. Gold's at $2,500, 2450 mm -hmm. The rest is profit. This is Jay Martin. Morgan, thank you so much for coming in to chat with me today. I'm super pumped, man. Yeah, I'm jazzed to be here. Okay, so there's a handful of different directions I want to go. Um, but here's where I want to start. So I've been in this business for 15 years. And what I've seen repeatedly, and even before I got into this sector, is that before a market really takes off, what you always see is the smartest money in the business get in, start structuring deals, and get their chips on the table. And so when the rest of the market's caught up and when all the retail investors have shown up, the smart money's sort of already been made and the big money's already been made. And when I was diving into the origin story of Next Gold, that's, that's how, what I was thinking about. I was like, look at these names. You've got, you know, Frank Justra, a Sprott Resource Corp, Extract Capital, getting something ready right now for the market. And I know Frank well enough to know how specific he is with his timing. Um, and uh, so I want to talk about that today. So first of all, um, give me in as, as quickly as possible, what is Nextgold? Nextgold is a vehicle that has a 3 million ounce resource in it that is near-term construction that has not only the geology and the, and the asset, but has the right team. So you have a team of exceptionally seasoned mine builders. Um, the team all the way down through the vertical, right through management. So not, not just the leaders, but all the way down into the team. So we have the ability to go out and build mines. We're going to start with Goliath. It's going to be 109,000 ounces per year um, for 13-ish years. And we're going to look expanding that. So... One of the greatest things that I, I think that I really draw, drew me to Next Gold and what was before, now Next Gold, mm -hmm. is the fact that you can come in here into a district that still has massive potential. You already have a resource. You're 16 months away from putting shovels in the ground. You have a team and you're in an asset that is so undervalued because of the way the markets have performed, because we went into that Lasan curve that you have a platform of growth. So we not only are we growing into that production style company, we're going through exploration, we're going to go through acquisition. So Next School is a platform for this that has low risk projects that have low capex, sub 400 million capex that we can put into production and replicate. And what were the initial pieces? So we have Treasury Minerals, we have Black Wolf. Yeah. Uh, talk to me about how the deal came together. It was a, it was an interesting deal because everyone always, always asked me like, wait, how do those two make sense together? A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> right. A and you, to your point earlier about how the Titans tend to get positioned, right? Yeah. Well, they may, first they do is they get their teams. They go and they find the people they want to work with and they go, okay, do you have enough vision? Do you have enough execution? Do you have enough drive? Mm -hmm. Go find some. Sure. And when I joined Black Wolf, we had a plan. I joined into the plan. You know, we drilled something and it didn't work out quite. The way we wanted to. That's exploration. That is the risk we take. Yeah. And, but we had a, you know, six million ton, or we still have a six million ton VMS, copper gold. And I'm like, how do we leverage this amazing investor base with Frank Justra, amazing talent base that we have with Rob McLeod and, and others in the geo side and, and a great board? How do I leverage this? And I, and a couple investors came to me, uh, from Treasury and they pulled me out, of course, for a lunch and a quick beer at, after one o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> and they said, Hey, have you ever looked at this treasury company? I was, Nope, never heard of it. Mm. Right away. I queued in when I started looking at it is why have I not heard of this? Like, how is this 3 million ounce resource that's near term buildable, low cost production? Like, how is, how have I not heard of this? I've been in the mining industry for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so I opened up the conversation with the management team with Jeremy Wyeth and Oren. Um, and it was very smooth. And it was just a very nice conversation. There was a lot of like synergies in how I like to do things, how Frank likes to build companies and put a bunch of things together and how they have the experience to build it. Right. So I was like, well, how do we combine these two to get Frank into the story, to bring our side in and to actually build something bigger? You know, often when you start, it's never two perfect assets coming together, right? You have usually 
a great one and an okay one. Right. But there's a lot of more synergies there together and a platform. And that's from the the human capital standpoint. From the human capital, from the investor base standpoint. Yeah. 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 You know, like like any big investor, they're going to want to figure out a way to get into the story without having to put $10 million up, right? Frank was four and a half million into Black Wolf already. Mm -hmm. And now he's seven million into the whole thing. Right. And so, I mean, to go from a blank slate didn't make sense, right? So, we, we worked together. We came up with what we think is a, was a good deal. Rebranded the company, put it together. And now we're, we're looking to grow it. So what you guys saw in treasury was the asset, the de-risked asset, right? What they saw in you was the capital markets expertise and the ability to raise cash, which is always the most important resource yeah. for a junior mining company is access to capital. Yeah. That's something that you and your team do very, very well in good markets and bad, right? And that was the marriage of value. Well, a hundred percent. And I, I really have to emphasize it wasn't just the asset that we saw as de risk. Okay. We saw the asset de risk because of the team. Right. It is next to impossible if you're not a major to build a builder team. That just makes yeah. sense. But to build a builder team. I, I get it. Yeah. To well, we've seen together. like a handful of companies attempt that and then stumble at the final yard line. Yeah. You know, it occurs. It, it occurs regularly. Yeah. They fumble because they, they didn't have continuity through it. So okay. you, you, they end up bringing in a different, whole different management team. We see this all the time. You get to an exploration phase, you're done, you're in your feasibility. We're like, oh crap, now we need to, we need to build this. Mm-hmm. And all the geos go, what do we do? Who do we hire? And then you're trying to put this team together versus going in there a little earlier, get the team to build itself, make sure it's cohesive, make sure there's synergies in the team and then build it out slowly from there. And this is, It's like the replication factor. We build one, we take that team, we plop it on the next, plop it on the next. That's how, you know, that's how companies like Equinox, that's how Neil Woodger built Endeavor, Eris, like you Hmm. keep these teams together because they know each other. Jeremy Wise, 35 years building mines. Jim Gallons used to be the president of Barrick Gold. Yeah. Like he was the CEO of De Beers Canada, probably the most notable mine builder in Canadian history, chairman of the board. Hmm. Paul McRae. 40 years mind building myself, 18 years projects in mind building. Like you get the hint after a while. You're like, we we're going to build a mining company. <laughs> right. Right. Now you referenced the Lassonde uh, curve. Yeah. Could you explain that a little bit for any investors who aren't familiar? It, it describes essentially when value is created for shareholders, right? And it's important to pay attention to where a company may be on that curve because there's, I mean, f- frankly, there's a good time and a bad time to buy great assets, right? Yeah. Or a good time and a great time, you could say. So is. What, what does that mean, the Lasson curve and where you're at? So the Lasson curve starts out at a very early stage project where it's greenfield, you haven't made a discovery. This is the like the base level. This is the lowest valuation. You make the discovery, it goes flying up because everyone's like, bam, new gold discovery, new copper. I mean, you saw it with Hercules Silver. You saw it with almost any one of these large com- or companies that make discoveries. And then they go through the phase of de-risking the asset. Then they get into the phases of which, as a building person, I look at it and go, actually, the real phase where you bring a lot of value, which is your PFS, FS, permitting. Mm-hmm. You go into permitting, the thing drops off. And it drops off from a, from a share price standpoint or a it volume can. standpoint because it's not exciting to the investor. Well, and where a lot of companies, and this is something we brought to Treasury or now next gold, the idea that we brought was a lot of companies get into that curve and they stop exploration. They're like, okay, we're fully focused on building. It's yeah. like, yeah, but you still need excitement in your story. Yeah. This is do you think Apple stops marketing because they sold a whack of iPhones this month? They market harder mm-hmm. and they're waiting for the next product, right? It's very similar in that sense. So, you know, I saw when we saw Treasury, it was at the bottom of that Lasson curve and we're like, well, hold on. You have probably another six months of this in, from closing, maybe, maybe even four. Our FS is coming out in Q1. Okay. And we have what we consider a 60, well, what is a 65 kilometer strike of basically untouched ground. We have two pits in the resource model, Goliath and Goldland, they're 25 kilometers apart. Mm -hmm. There's no pinholes between. No expiration done. Like just boots on the ground, looking at rocks, you know, the typical generative work that you do, but very little between there, any, and then north of Goldland, nothing. Okay. But you have continuous rock package. You have showings everywhere. And so we were like, let's go on to the other side of the curve. Let's go back to that discovery phase while we're finishing and getting into the other phase. So let's, let's set this company up for a dual leverage approach. So you can actually 
get some high leverage from it. The dual leverage being you're going to, you're intending to build the mine at Goliath, but between Goliath, 25 kilometers to the north, I believe, right? Yep. Goldland, um, you've done no exploration, but there's every reason to believe that this trend continues. Can you elaborate on that a little bit for me? Yeah. So around Goliath, there, there's fold nose, far east. We've done drilling, pinholing around it. Okay. But in that trend up, nothing. Okay. There's, we've done Adam, uh, Adam is the director of exploration. Adam Larson's his name. Been there 13 years, hyper smart, has done all the work, all the geophysics, all the, you know, the typical stuff that a mining company does to find targets. Yeah. And just as the company transitioned in this build and, and permit finishing permitting phase, they just stopped exploration, right? There's dilution. There's all the things. Well, it's kind of a, it's kind of a falling knife in a sense. Whereas if, if you like, if you stop, it falls. If you don't stop, you're probably diluting to keep going, but there's a potential to keep your share price at least stable, right? Yes. And unfortunately, I mean, we've seen that in the mining industry time and time and time again. So this is why mid-tiers love, love waiting for us to make a decision to go, you know, we're going to go into development. They're like, cool, we're going to wait six months until your share price falls. And we're going to take you out. Right. 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 And so that, that's the curve. So for us, that 25 kilometers is the same rocks, same package. Lots of outcrop. We've done all the work over the past 13 years to identify areas. We're drilling an area right now called Interlakes. Imagine inter between two lakes and yeah. there. Um, and that's a very perspective zone. Like, right. I want to find more. So I just want to, I want to spend one more minute on the Lausanne curve just sure. because we have new viewers coming into the channel all the time. And I, I don't like taking anything for granted, but this is a really important concept. So, uh, the beginning of the curve, you see this steep, um, value creation, opportunity if an a, if exploration is successful and a resource is discovered and that's because exploration is exciting it's super super high risk and it attracts a certain kind of investor who's comfortable for that risk hopefully has a whole basket of investment opportunities and is looking for that 5x 20x return in the event that one of these exploration companies hits something big discovers a resource that could become a mine one day and the share price skyrockets the second big milestone in that company's life is way down the road. And this is actually getting to production, right? Turning on cash flow and bringing a product to the market. But in between milestone A and milestone B, you could say two things. You could say there's a boring period where things have to be built and news flow slows down because most companies stop exploring and they stop putting out more results, right? But secondly, it's almost like two different investors, right? And you have to, you have to bridge the early stage exploration investor for the longer term or just the less, more risk averse investor down the road. Does that make sense? Yeah, you nailed it hundred percent. And you actually see, and, and what I've seen in the past is you see a rotation of shareholders. Yes. So you go from the right. high risk shareholders. Exactly. Okay. To the longer term shareholders. And, and you often see about, you, you often see a, a price decline from that. Yeah. And because you know how markets work, then people are selling, people are buying and you're rotating the type of story you're telling. What the great thing about us is that we can appeal to this side, which is the high risk side. We're going to make a new discovery. We're going to show a massive district potential, which, you know, I believe we will, mm -hmm. but we're also coming into that development, building a mine side, yeah. which I call the actual business plan. Yeah. <laughs> the, right. How are we going to get profitable as fast as humanly possible and stop dilution? Yeah. Love that's, that. you know, and that's, I was talking to Frank today about it. And, you know, the way we look at this is how do we get as quickly to stopping dilution as possible? Which yeah. means okay. how do we make our shareholders more money? Yeah. And better value. Right. Right. And along the way, you're going to be doing your best to increase the ounce count right now. 3.4. Uh, between, so Goliath Goldland, that complex is about 3 million ounces. Okay. But it's key to remember that when not all ounces are created equally. Sure. And not all exploration ounces are categorized equally. Right. So we're in the what they call the high confidence M&I category, which means 2.1 million of our ounces are very, very well defined. Mm -hmm. There is some in the inferred, which are less well defined, but can be upgraded. Yeah. Niblack has about 800,000 gold equivalent ounces. So yeah, we're 3.5 to 3.8 million ounces currently in our portfolio. Okay. Okay. So walk me back to the share structure a little bit. We talked about some of the money that Frank Juster put in. I mentioned at the front end, Sprott Resource Corp is also the shareholder as is Extract Capital. Yep. And I believe collectively they might own around 30% of the company. Yep. Um, can I ask you what percentage of your net worth do you have in this company, Morgan? I love that you asked that question, not how many shares do you own. 
Okay. That's, and I, I just want to elaborate. I was in Spain at a, at a conference and I was at, a, I was at this lunch table and, uh, so I'm sitting there and we're having this great conversation with this, this German guy and the Swiss guy and, and this nice lady, she was there from, uh, from London and she looks at me and she goes, how many shares do you own? And then, and the German guy kind of looks at me and the Swiss guy looks at her and goes, wrong question. Okay. The question you should be asking is how much of your net worth is tied up in this? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause not all of us are created equal. Some of sure. us haven't had our big wins yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would say, so during the transaction, I was supposed to get a change of control. I took all of that and jammed it back into RSUs. So the okay. RSU package that I got issued was not a bonus. It was literally my change of control, which I opted to take as shares. As equity. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. and I continually buy, I'd say 40% to 50% right now. Of your net worth. Of my, I would say net worth that isn't included in real estate of my own personal like yeah. holding on yeah. that side of it. Yeah. But of my liquid net worth, 50%. I love it, man. Well, I mean, skin in the game is, is ultimately what I want to hear, right? Yeah. And what every prospective shareholder wants to hear is that if you get rich, it means I'm getting rich, right? And you don't get rich until you make me rich too, right? Uh, that's the game. And, uh, and you're with the team that's done that a few times before. So I look at the shareholder base. Um, and I, I, I think what's the long term plan? Because Broad Resource Corp, Justra, Extract, they're not coming together for, you know, 120,000 ounces a year, long term, right? Yep. So what's the bigger vision for next gold? And is that number correct? Goliath right now, you know, in production, looking around 110, 130 ounces per year, something like this? Yeah. So the first seven years is 116,000 average. We do hit up to 124. Okay. okay. It just fluctuates based on the mine development plan. Yeah. Um, average over the whole mine life is 109. So let's say 100. Average over the whole mine life is 109. Okay. I'm with you. Um, which when you think about it from a, let's think about it as a business model before we get into the vision. Think about we're going to produce at about 1,030 all in sustaining cost. Gold's at $2,500, 2450 mm -hmm. The rest is profit. So when you think about a business model, we your ASIC is $1,030. Yeah. It's looking like, okay. Yeah. So that's from, from our PFS. To hone it in more on the FS, we don't expect it to change much. Okay. When you look at it as a business model, if I'm, if I'm looking at how fast, if I build X tower in real estate, do I get paid back five to 10 years? This project pays back in under two years. We're cash flowing 150 to 200 million after tax throughout the whole thing mm -hmm. a year. Think about that as a business model. That's a pretty darn good business model, right? Mm -hmm. That business model only works when you have the right team to build it and operate it. That was the key part for this. Great resource, right team. Yeah. Vision for the company. And you're right. You know, a, a lot of people say 110,000 ounces a year. You know, how much do people care? I'll give you an example about how much people care. Orla Mining is a really good example about how much people care. They're $1.7 billion company. If you have the right resource base, mm -hmm. expandability, and your cash flowing, you can trade eight to 10 times your cash flow. Sure. After tax, which this should be able to do. Um, but the vision for the company is, is, to build a mid tier. I mean, I really like how Frank's done this before. Actually, I love it. He's, you know, his most successful model has always been the buy build. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that say they're doing it, but how, how do they do? It? Do they have the ability to do it? Mm -hmm. Do you have the right team to do it? This is when, when we were putting next school together and, and why we put all these pieces together, it was a strategy. It was Frank and myself and the team were sitting around and we're not sitting around, we're working. <laughs> But we're sitting there going, okay, well, what's the piece we're going to need? We're going to need the mind building team. Okay. What are we going after? Well, first, for the first few projects, let's go after projects that are 80 to 120,000 ounces a year. Okay. Sub 400 million market cap, easier to finance, lower risk. Okay. Let's go for open pits. Okay. That are, you know, s s five to 7,000 tons per day. Again, not blowing the capex, not blowing the bank, lower risk, high, highly defined projects. Goliath is a start. Fits that model. Right. Then we want to expand. Ideally, we're two to 400,000 ounces a year within five. Okay. Two to 400,000 ounces per year within five. So you're, you're chasing like a caliber model. Yeah. Similar. I love what Darren did. They're yeah. awesome. They're very great, smart guy. Great plan. Yeah. Great plan. And it works. And it you're works. You're in a high gold environment. Yeah. Should always work. So, so walk me through. You said 16 months until shovels in the ground. Yep. 
on Goliath. This means mine construction is yep. what that means, building the mine that will produce your 109,000 ounces per year. In terms of news flow between today, you know, end of August, 60 months down the road, yeah. how are you going to keep shareholders excited? What can we expect? Well, so this, is, this was a big part of the shift in plan and how we split the company up. So Jeremy Wyeth is the CEO. I'm the president. He's responsible, you know, mainly for that mine build, the per finishing the permitting feasibility study. And when we sat down, we said, let's split this company up. You do that. I'll take care of capital. I'll work with the capital markets. We'll go back to exploration. So we just announced a 25,000 meter drill program. So for the next nine months, we're going to be cranking out results. Yeah. That will and and I can through. assume this is focused on that twenty five kilometer yeah. strike zone right yeah, there. Yeah, a little bit around each resource. Each yeah. one of the resources are still open at depth and open along strike. Okay, we only constrained them for the feasibility reasons to actually build yeah. the mill. Got it. They're still wide open, which means you can find more deeper. You can find more long strike, mm -hmm. but the cost to drill versus the cost to go into production made more sense to go into production. Yeah, got it. Okay. So they're going to have news flow from that. You're going to have feasibility in Q one. You're going to have Permits, permits, permits starting to pile in. Uh, agreements with First Nations we're working on. We just announced one with the Wabagoon First Nation uh, just beside the project. Yeah. And that was our exploration agreement. Again, a mile, huge milestone for us, right? Mm. A, lot of these, uh, a lot of these milestones, they compile. They take years and years to get. And this is why I love the entry point for next school right now. Because you're, at, you're coming out of that Lausanne curve. You're, you're kind of right at the bottom coming out of it. But now we're getting exciting with the exploration going, maybe this is a 5 million ounce district. Maybe mm. this is a 8, 10. Who knows? I'm not going to forward look it. But you can find a lot more. You can't tell me that you have a pit, 25 kilometers, you have a pit, and there's nothing in between. Right. And the right rocks. Like, it's, it's, there's something there. Yeah. We're going to go find them. Yeah. And we're going to expand this. So it should give you hope that in doing that, you start to build the mine. Now you extend the life. You add more resource. You add higher grades or whatever the grades come out to. Be. Yeah. Keep adding. Yeah. So maybe this is a 20 or 30 year mine life. Versus yeah, you got to find out. Versus a 10 or 13. Yeah. Right. And so that's the 25,000 meter drill program over nine months. It's like a fact finding mission. You're going to look to expand the resource around each pit, Goldlum and uh, Goliath. But let's see where else you might want to get to work within this 25 kilometer stretch. Exactly. Bring, bring that excitement back to to the to this project and the yeah. story it's, it's really as someone that's you know built been part of mine builds on every continent of this planet i look at something like this and go what an opportunity to crank out 100 plus thousand ounces a year because generally barrack started with forty thousand. caliber started with forty thousand. like they they took something and they grinded for years to build and then buy the next one and grinded for yep. years and build yeah the great thing about having a Frank and the vision that he can bring in and the network and the team that we have mm -hmm. is we can do it quicker. We can do it more efficiently. We have the right project to do. Yeah. The right base. Yeah. This thing will grow quick. I want to touch on your background a little bit. You mentioned you've been involved in mine builds on pretty much every continent in the world. So tell me some stories, Morgan. Like tell me some highlights and lessons learned along the way. Oh, you know, the hardest, the, 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 the best lessons to learn are through failure, that's for sure. Okay, tell um, me more. So when I was 24, I, I, so I actually, when I was younger, I started with New Gold at Afton. Uh, started building, helped help to build that. And then ended up going to Freeport in Indonesia, Graspa. There is nothing more daunting to a 24-year-old to go to 14,000 feet in a foreign country on the island, of Pop, the other half of Papua New Guinea. Yeah. And someone asks you questions like, what would you do with $300 million if I gave it to you? You learn humility really fast mm. and you learn it whether you want to or not. Okay. <laughs> because in a lot of these countries, the idea isn't as an expat to be there long term. The idea is to train someone to take your job. Sure. That's the idea. I mean, why not? Right? Yeah. And in doing that, you have to make sure that those ideas are not yours. Okay. So you're training people while you're bringing them to your idea and they're ensuring it's their idea. Mm-hmm. And as a 24 year old, you know, you've got uh, something to prove. You're still wet back here and you're running around like, woo. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm at the biggest mine in the world. Of course. Ah, of course. Great things are going to happen. And then you get beat down with a stick. 
Right. And they get back up and you're like, yeah, we're going to do this great project. It's going to be great. And they're like, no, no, you're not going to do that project. They're going to do that project. Uh-huh. You're like, okay. Mm-hmm. And then strikes happen. And there was a couple strikes there when I was there. So an 8,000 person picket line wasn't ideal. Yeah. Uh, right. So one of the engineers that worked for me there ended up quitting, um, wanted to move over to Rio Tinto, Mongolia. And he phones me and he goes, had enough yet? I'm like, no, oh, I've only been here a year. He's like, yeah, cool. You're coming to work for me now. I'm like, oh God. Okay. <laughs> All right. And that was the lesson to learn is it doesn't matter if someone's working for you right now, you may work for them. And it was, we had a really good relationship. Mm-hmm. Thank God. But uh, I've had that happen just so many times to me where someone was working for me or I was working for someone and then I was their boss. Mm-hmm. And then I was maybe the president of the company. And it is a very fun, fun lesson to learn at a young age from a headstrong farm kid. I love that. Yeah. Okay. Now, after so much international exposure in a variety of jurisdictions with various political risk, now you're focused on Canada, right? And is that intentional or is it just this project looks right and the team was perfect? That's why we're in Canada. And when you look at expansion, you know, where's that going to go? It's a good question. Uh, let's back that up and understand why I'm back. Okay. Um, so I, I moved to Africa. I, I built a metallurgical steel project in Canada and went down to Peru, helped build one there, started consulting in Ghana for a company called Golden Star Resources. And I came back and started working for Sabina. Yeah. Bruce McLeod. I was yeah, an engineering yeah. manager. And, uh, within about three months, my job went from, you're going to be responsible for design and build the design of the, the process plant to, we got to build this. And we need someone on site to run it. And I'm like, what do you mean run it? There's tents up there. He's like, yeah, yeah, there's tents up there. So I spent just about two straight months in the Arctic on, in a tent in like starting in March. Okay. Cold. Yes. We're landing Hercules airplanes on ice strips on yeah. the Arctic ocean. We're assembling equipment. Like it was insane. Like some of the stuff we're doing is like a national geographic should have filmed this. And uh, I get back and my wife at the time was pregnant and they're like, we need you up in the Arctic for like three weeks a month. Well, and I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I left the mining industry at that time. I was in North Vancouver, fell in love with it. And of course you get that random call says, do you want to join the junior mining market as a CEO? And you're like, yes. Ended up getting drawn into the Frank Juster sphere, which is, it's not a bad sphere. I, I got to tell you when you, <laughs> when you get a phone call from like Sean Coon Coon or Rob McLeod going, Hey, I want you to come in, meet Frank. You're sitting there like, yeah, okay. You want me to meet Frank Schuster? All right. Yeah. You know, like I'm, the guy's like a hero in the legend. Like you, you don't just walk up to that guy, you know, sat with him, the nicest guy you've ever met. I'm sure as you've talked to him and you can just see when you're talking, how things are clicking mm-hmm. and you're like, man, that's someone I want to surround myself with. Like, yeah, you like hyper successful, hyper entrepreneurial, not just in the mining space, like Lionsgate yeah. films and a yeah. bunch of other successes. Yeah. And I would say since the year and a half of being there now, my entrepreneurial side's gone through the roof. We formed Next Gold and you just surround yourself with these people and, and listen. I know I'm doing a lot of talking right now, but man, that's what you're here for. The, the great thing. So this is like the greatest was the greatest probably lesson I've learned so far. It was, you know, Frank and I were sitting around and he was just telling me about times where he was worried about companies failing and mm-hmm. failures. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm like, come on. <laughs> like, yeah, right. He's like, oh, yeah, back in the day, I'm not going to tell a story for him, but uh, you, you, you get the sense that it's never easy to be successful. It's, it, success just doesn't happen easily. There's the odd people that win the lottery. Sure. Or you happen to be at the exact right place at the exact right time with the right amount of capital and you got lucky. Yeah. But success is a long drawn out process of continually upgrading yourself, Mm -hmm. upgrading your knowledge, upgrading the people around you into closer confidants, into people that you, you want to, you know, be like, or you want to learn from. So it's pretty, it's been pretty fun so far. I I love that. You know, what you're making me think of is this quote, when people look at hyper successful individuals, they always ask the question, like, what's the thing? What's the thing that they did? They must have some extraordinary thing about them. And what it almost always comes down to is that there's never one extraordinary thing. 
but that's somebody who did ordinary things for an extraordinary amount of time. And it was the consistency and durability and duration and persistence that eventually pays the piper. You're right. And I, I think it's the no quit. It's the no quit attitude. It's, that was what I learned the most from Frank's stories. Interesting. Was if something doesn't work, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. Mm. It just doesn't work in that iteration. Yeah. It doesn't work in that project. It doesn't work in this perfect time. But you keep iterating and you keep inventing and you keep finding out how to make that business work. Mm. Right. He's done that so many times. And he just, when you hear that from someone that's done it and you see that gleam in their eyes going, Oh, he's serious. <laughs> There's just no stop. <laughs> like, right. Right. So uh, my friends and family say the same thing to me all the time. They're like, do you like, do you ever have a moment where you're just like, screw it, I'm done? Mm. I'm like, if I ever get to that moment, I get more motivated because I'm like, oh, I'm onto something. Right. I'm onto something. Yeah. It yeah. stressed me enough out that I, and I deal with stress generally pretty well. Yeah. It stressed me enough out that I'm feeling like quitting. This is when you dive in more. This sure. is when you push. Yeah. Feel like the markets right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is what hard feels like. And this is why most people quit, right? It's those that persevere. Yeah. Okay. So I want to, I want to close the loop on next goal then. Um, I, I love the origin story and, uh, the joining of two forces, marrying the operational capital, right? The mind builders yep. with the capital markets expertise. Um, and very frequently, as you know, you see stories with one or the other, but not both. And that can be a recipe for failure. It can be a great project with poor management and they can take it quickly. We've seen that countless times and recently, right? Good projects yep. that just can't get dragged over the line because of, um, uh, some mismanagement, let's just say. Mm -hmm. Um, and you scooped up this assets during the trough of the Lassonde curve, which is great from a sentiment standpoint, right? Because um, now you get to, to finish the job, right? But your mission here is to do so while expanding the ounce count and keeping those expiration investors excited and new ones joining the team about the potential in the future. Um, but the bigger vision is to obviously, let's get Goliath into production. Let's prove to the market it's bigger than we currently know it is. But we're looking everywhere right now for expansion because we don't want to be just a junior producer, but we're looking at becoming a mid-tier. And we've got a team that's done that a few times before. Yeah. Put a pipeline in. Put this pipeline is, this is a key thing I think shareholders should understand. If, you're, if, if, you're, if you have that specific team, you have that skill set, and you have the capital markets, putting a pipeline of assets together that increase, it's much more difficult to find the ounces. It's much more difficult and more expensive to find a million ounces right now oh, yeah. in a market like this than to go buy them. It's much more expensive to keep the team to do that. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're right, things have failed, things have moved. There's, there are projects out there that could add to our pipeline. There's projects out there that could probably be built before Goliath. There's projects yeah. out there that could be built after the Goliath. I would say we're probably one of the top three or top five buildable assets right now at its stage in Canada. Yeah. It's a pretty cool thing. It's great. And we're trading at 0.07 to nav. On average, okay. developers trade about 0.2. Yeah. And yeah. then they go up from there until their production. They trade between 0.8 and 1.2. Okay. Well, look, Morgan, I want to have you back to catch up along sure. the way and check in on drill results, uh, check in. You said feasibility studies coming out Q1. Yep. 25. That's the game plan. And then obviously progress as we migrate down our 16 month game plan here. Um, but look, dude, it's been awesome having you on and, and hearing it from you. Yeah. And uh, I look forward to next time.